Welcome to the Harvard Art Museums. In tonight's lecture, Rare and Beautiful Objects, New and Unexpected Findings, Revisiting Harvard's Early Chinese Jades. My name is Caitlin Howe, and I am a sophomore living in Courier House, and I concentrate in the history of an art and architecture. I am a member of the Harvard Art Museum's student board, and I am delighted to welcome you to the museum on behalf of our student community. Please, now be sure to turn off your cell phones and help me to warmly welcome So Young Lee, the Landon and Lavinia Clay Chief Curator of the Harvard Art Museums, who will introduce tonight's program. Good evening, thank you, Caitlin. We have an amazing group of student board members and I'm always so grateful for their involvement and these poised students who come up here and introduce us. So welcome, it's my pleasure um, to have this honor of giving the welcoming um, opening remarks. Um, we've already said the title, but welcome to Rare and Beautiful Objects, New and Unexpected Findings revisiting Harvard's early Chinese jades. This is a really a long-term project that's come to fruition and we're all extremely excited to have Jenny back with us. Um, now before I dive into introducing our main speaker of the evening, please indulge me in saying a few words of thanks to those who made this evening possible. Now, first, of course, we'd like to acknowledge the generosity of um, Grenville L. Winthrop, the collector whose collection, um, gifted to the Harvard Art Museums, made this work possible. Um, he was a New York-based um, attorney and prolific art collector. Uh, Winthrop bequeathed his entire collection, nearly 4,000 works, to his alma mater, Harvard, Harvard, upon his death in 1943. And the collection ranges widely. Um, so of course, the incredible ancient Chinese collection, including the jades, um, but from paintings to drawings to sculpture, from so including Western European art, Ang or Whistler and the pre-Raphaelites, um, but also ancient Americas, as well as uh, near and far east. Now, although the entire gift was uh, transformative for the Harvard Art Museums, uh, it's the nearly 700 jade objects that we will celebrate tonight. So without Winthrop's thoughtful generosity, this whole program would not be possible. But in addition to the gift of the collection, um, this evening is made possible by some of our generous supporters. And we'd like to thank the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation for a generous grant that supported um, this project. And we're very grateful to the Harvard Yenching Institute for the fellowship that allowed Jenny so to come um, and spend a semester here in Cambridge reviewing the Winthrop Collection and then writing this book. The Andrew W. Mellon Publication and the, um, publication and the Henry P. McHenry Fund helped um, make the, pub the publication possible. Um, and lastly, support for this particular, this evening's program, the lecture, is provided by M. Victor Leventritt Fund, which was established through the generosity of his wife, children, and friends of the late uh, Mr. Leventritt, Harvard class of 1935. And um, with, with that generous fund, we have been able to share so much of our collection and programming with the public and with the Harvard um, community and in fact the greater Boston community. So at long last I get to introduce Jenny. Jenny So received her BA from Swarthmore College and MA and PhD in art history from Harvard so she's our very own. <laughs> um, and her mentor was Max Lur, and those of us in the field of East Asian art, but Chinese art in particular, that's a, a, a big name, um, who was in fact author of the first catalog of the Winthrop Jades, published in 1975. And she has served as a senior curator at the Freer and Sackler galleries of the Smithsonian um, Institution in charge of their ancient Chinese art collection. She left the Smithsonian um, to take up the position of Professor of Fine Arts at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and later was also appointed Director of that university's Institute of Chinese Studies and subsequently the Art Museums. She retired from her full-time Hong Kong appointments in 2015, 
retaining an association as adjunct professor, and returned to live in Arlington, Virginia. So she's back stateside. Um, where she continues to publish while serving as a specialist consultant in Chinese art for many American and international institutions and foundations. Jenny So has published widely on early Chinese art, focusing on materials and cultural exchange, as well as um, on collecting and connoisseurship. Her books include Chinese Jades from the Robert and Sissy Tong Collection, 2015, Radiant Legacy, Ancient Chinese Gold um, in the Mengdishan Collection, 2013, Traders and Raiders on China's Northern Frontier, uh, 1995, and Eastern Zhou Ritual Bronzes in the Arthur M. Sackler Collection from 1995. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jenny So. Okay, can you hear me um, all the way in the back? Good, if you can't, just raise your hand. Um, well, thank you very much, Su Yang, for this uh, wonderful introduction um, to my home, <laughs> home institution. I, I still can't get over the transformation of the museum uh, from the days it were when I was a student here but it's a good transformation, and I, I, I just love it here. Um, and I think it's just uh, entirely my pleasure and my delight to be able to do this, to be able to uh, write this book for the collection. The backstory to my book actually began in the 70s when I came to Harvard as a graduate student to study with Max Ler. Ler at that time was working on the catalog of archaic Chinese jades um, with the help of Louisa Huber um, uh, in the Winthrop collection. And as Su Yang said, that catalog, still a primary reference for the, uh, for the collection in the field, was published in 1975. So we are talking 40 years ago. Um, all graduate students at that time enjoyed the privilege of virtually daily encounters with this magnificent collection. And this, is, this photograph brings back fond memories. Uh, I'm not sure that's me, but I think it should be me. Um, just looking intensely. This is what Ler taught us. Look carefully, closely and intensely. So to be able to work on this book today, uh, after all these years, is my small token of appreciation for this exceptional opportunity and exceptional training that I received at Harvard. So fast forward to 2010. I was no longer a graduate student. I have been working 10 years at the Smithsonian, and I have come to know the two remarkable early Chinese collections at both the Freer and the Sackler Gallery there. And then, of course, I left the Smithsonian and went to Hong Kong and did something very different. Um, I taught. So I went from the museum world into the university world and advised graduate students uh, in early Chinese art. Meanwhile, China's cultural revolutions end, and the country's economic development um, uncovered an overwhelming wealth of archaeological material. And being right in Hong Kong on the edge of all of that is possibly the most exciting time of my life. Um, I can take a long weekend and go into <laughs> China and look at new discoveries and, and tour museums. And that has been a tremendous help for me in my research. But at the same time, the, the more I get to know about what's going on in the field, the more I came to realize that uh, despite this explosion of material and 
incredible uh, number of publications that's come out, there is no accessible account in either English or Chinese that makes sense of this myriad of new material that has surfaced, particularly on early Chinese jades. So one purpose behind my book is to provide a framework to navigate some of this material. So what do we know now that Le probably didn't know 40 years ago? A lot. But one of the things, very important, is that we now have evidence that the jade production began in China at least over seven millennium years ago, or around 5,000 BC or more, uh, in different parts of China, here, northeast, southeast, northwest, mostly Neolithic communities using material that they could find in the nearby locations. And it is only oh, 3, 2, 3,000 years later, by the early uh, centuries AD or last centuries BC, that um, they started importing material from far Central Asia here. And by the late uh, imperial era, around 17th, 18th century, they started importing jadeite, another major um, material uh, in what is now northern Burma or northern Myanmar. So essentially, most of the jade that you will see tonight, that you will see in any museum in the United States that claims to be early from China should derive from various sources within China itself and some from Central Asia, the far western regions of China. Now, outside of that, I'd like to uh, highlight one very important and interesting phenomenon. Chinese jade history is more than 5,000 years old. And it has yielded by far the largest body of worked jade artifacts created by a single civilization. While other jade working cultures in India, uh, New Zealand, Central, and North America have come and gone, China's jade working industry has continued. This is a picture I took when I visited a modern uh, jade, working work, uh, jade workshop in Hangzhou in 2017. <coughs> Excuse me. So what can account for this longevity? The durability of jade, which is really just a piece of stone, cannot be the only explanation. Why did certain elite individuals in China's Neolithic communities chose jades for their burial furniture? Here, just a random example of a Neolithic burial from uh, along the Yangtze River area, uh, where the, the uh, person was buried with Ooh, uh, over 200 jade and hard stone axes, completely covering the, the body. Um, and he wore 10 bracelets on each arm. This is a burial from around, uh, from between 3500 and 3000 BC. And then all the way down the timeline to these imperial princes of the Han Dynasty, the second century BC. Who, who was uh, buried inside jade encrusted coffins, their bodies encased in a jade suit completely. So why did these individuals choose to go to their death and be buried in this way? Why was jade considered a worthy material to house a sacred Buddhist relic that was dedicated by a 9th century Tang Dynasty emperor. Here is a white jade casket shaped, very small casket shaped uh, um, uh, um, 
reliquary encased inside a rock crystal casket-shaped reliquary. Um, inside the white jade casket is supposedly the finger bone of the Buddha. Why? Why was jade um, considered important enough for scholar of officials like uh, Lu Daling and Li Gonglin of the 10th and 11th century and 12th centuries AD? Why did they collect, study, and actually made the first catalogues of jades in their collection? And here is an example of a second century jade disc that was buried in, uh, with one of the members of the Liu family. So it is a second century disc buried in a 10th century, 11th century tomb. So it's clearly collected. And here is a drawing, in those days there are no photography, a drawing of a piece that was in his collection, which curiously closely resembles a piece in the Winthrop collection. So these scholar officials of the Song Dynasty collected, was buried with, cataloged, studied these jades. Why did they thought, thought it was important enough for them to do this? And then why did the 18th century Emperor Qianlong wrote poem after poem in praise of archaic jades, sometimes engraving them on the jades themselves? Here is a piece in the Winthrop collection with um, the poem engraved on the edge, around the edge, and a piece in another collection in the Harvard Art Museums that few people know about, the Dane collection, that also has an inscription and the imperial seal of the Chenlong Emperor engraved around the edge. So furthermore, was it mere coincidence that the names of the hero and heroine of one of China's foremost literary classic, The Dream of the Red Chamber, as Bao Yu, or Precious Jade, and Black Jade. These are the names of the hero and the heroine of this cl classic Chinese novel. And that the novel's original title is Story of the Stone. What was it about Jade that attracted early 20th century collectors like Freer, Winthrop, Sonnenschein, Pillsbury, and Brundage to build the collections that we have in these various museums around um, North America. And here I should add Ernest and Helen Pratt Dane, the, the other collection that I mentioned that is in the Harvard Art Museums, which included 300 plus jades from the 17th to 19th century that was presented to then the Fogg Museum in 1942. I don't think very many people know about this collection. I only discovered this working on the Winthrop collection. And as the Chinese economy boomed, jade objects became one of the first things the nouveau riche chose as markers of their success. So already by the 90s, huge sums of monies were being paid for a piece of archaic jade, like this what, uh, three and a quarter inch tall white jade figure of a dancer that was sold at Christie's in 1994 for over $300,000. And then uh, later in, in 2014, uh, a, a ritual object like this one in the Freer, in, in the Winthrop collection went for over $200,000 um, in New York. Now this fascination with jade extends down to even the decorative objects. I think every Chinese mother would give her daughter a jade pendant, either for a birthday or for her wedding. That's a very, very small way showing the attraction of jade to the general populace. For the richer people, we have a decorative jadeite uh, incense burner. That This one is in the Dane collection. Um, that was 
sold, not this one, but something like it, um, sold for millions of dollars at auction. This piece, in fact, has a very interesting history. It was stolen from the fog um, 40 years ago and was recovered only in 2014 after uh, an attempt to sell it at auction in 2009. So we are very happy that the fog now regains this piece that came from the Dane collection and it's back home again. And of course, the very, very famous uh, jadeite necklace that used to belong to the actress Barbara Hutton or the heiress Barbara Hutton. It sold in 2014 for a whopping 27.4 million back to the house of Cartier that designed it. So in America, diamonds may be a girl's best friend. In China, jade is a girl's best friend. So underpinned by archaeological discoveries and looking at jade's roles throughout Chinese history, I can suggest now that jade's persistent presence in Chinese culture is the result of successive layers of meaning added to the material and to the products. Starting with its early association with uh, spiritualism among the Neolithic communities from the fifth and third century uh, millennium BC to its full integration into the political, philosophical, religious, and social context of subsequent millennia. During the, its extended engagement in the lives of the social and ruling as well as ordinary people, jade has become so firmly rooted in Chinese life that when a new, and I should say socialist China, emerges onto the global arena to host the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, the government chose jade as the centerpiece for the medals awarded to its athletes. Using the very traditional um, hierarchy associated with the color of jade. So the gold medal has pure white jade, the silver medal has a pale yellowish green jade, and the copper, a bronze medal, has the dark green jade. So more than 5,000 years down the line, changes of regime, changes of political philosophy, jade survives and persisted. So the complex layers of this history is laid out in the book, in the various chapters of the book. I shall not attempt to uh, repeat it here. Uh, like Lur's 1975 catalog, um, I focus, my book focuses on Jade's early history, um, using mainly Jade's from the Winthrop Bequest of 1943. So you will see on my um, images always Winthrop 1943 dot dot dot, those are the accession numbers. Um, for those images that do not have any labeling, it comes primarily from archaeological sources. Now, the later history of jade in China, that is about 2,000 years or so, might be covered by a future project um, using the Dane collection uh, in the same museum. And this was the same donor, actually, who donated the magnificent collection of Junware that was the focus of an exhibition um, uh, curated by Melissa Moy in uh, 2017, I think, right? So tonight, I will focus on a very small sampling of the 100 or so pieces highlighted in the book. Uh, pieces that exemplify the heights of rarity, the artistic excellence, and some of the new things that we've learned in the process of revisiting this collection. But before we move on, to these pieces, let's do a very quick review of what we know, what we understand about jade. Jade is, as I said, a stone. And traditionally, we think of jade as two types of uh, material, nephrite and jadeite. Nephrite is what has been worked in China since 5000 BC or more. It 
Whereas jadeite is something that was introduced into China around the 18th century BC, imported from Burma. Both of them are very hard. Nephrite jadeite are in six to seven uh, uh, Mohs hardness. This is a grading system, um, a scientifically recognized diamond being 10 on the scale. Okay, so this is fairly high on the hardness scale. And nephrite, when pure, is essentially white. Jadeite, most of the time, comes in various shades of, gray, uh, of green. So this is what we will be talking about in terms of the raw material. Now, what does this mean to the jade worker, the maker of jade, and also for us, the collector or lover? Uh, what it means is that the hardness of jade uh, says, tells us that it's harder than most metals, it's harder than steel in some cases, and because of its crystalline structure of densely packed bundles, it's very tough. And a, 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 an easy way to think of this is your barbecue skewers, your bamboo skewers. If you take one bamboo skewer, you can snap it very easily. But if you have a whole bundle of them, it will be very hard for you to snap it. So that's toughness. And this is what I mean by toughness. So as a result, jade is never carved in the traditional sense, with Michelangelo going at his marble with a chisel and, and a hammer. The worker's tool never comes into contact with jade. Jade is, is worked by grinding. That is, using an, an uh, abrasive made out of stone that is harder than it. Okay, so the tool itself can be anything. It could be wood, it could be, it could be sinew, it could be uh, um, bamboo, it could be something very, very soft, much softer than jade. It doesn't matter. It's the abrasives who do the damage. Now, what these two images tell you is that this is taken in Beijing, in a jade workshop in Beijing in the 1930s. And it shows two workmen going at it manually with a bow saw, trying to cut open a one cubic foot of jade boulder. It took them roughly a couple of weeks to just slice one slice out of a cubic foot of boulder. The next image here shows you what it is in a workshop today, about a year or two ago. That's a workman using an electrically driven saw, going at spinning at about 170 miles per hour. And he would be doing the grinding and the cutting of the jade. So all this is on account of the hardness and the toughness of jade. So with that in mind, imagine what it would be like for a jade worker from 5000, 4000 BC trying to work something out of jade. So now we get to see some of these early pieces. This piece is in the Winthrop collection, um, uh, in the original catalog. Lur had indicated an Eastern Zhou date, which means uh, anywhere from 600 BC to about 300 BC. Um, beautiful condition, um, almost pristine, almost new, um, beautifully ground. And yet, we now know through archaeological ex excavations, and these are excavated parallels, that this actually goes back to about 2000 or 1700 BC. So it's something that Le could not have known when he was working on his uh, 1975 catalog. This is what archaeology has done for us um, over, the, over the years. Now, another example is this one. 
Again, um, it's a cicada. And um, in Lur's catalog, he said something about it being Western Zhou, which says it's early first millennium BC. This is the top view. This is a side view. Um, beautifully, again, beautiful material. Um, translucent, sort of when you shine a light through it, it's almost like a pool of greenish water. And wonderful thing about this is that another excavated example uh, came out from a site that dates to around 2000 BC. So we are again pushing this all the way back and a thousand years in terms of date. Um, in both th these examples, the cicada and the uh, fluted uh, ornament um, that you just saw, um, you noticed how smooth the, the modeling is, um, how, how rounded the whole thing is. And I put in a, a marble sculpture for comparison. It's almost the same sculptural effect, the roundness of the smoothing and of, of, of all the planes, but marble is a much softer material. It's only three on most scale. And uh, you have to really appreciate how difficult it is to get jade nephrite to be so rounded, so smooth, and so sculptural in quality. When in fact, the majority of things, of jades made in early China are flat like these, like this one. Um, a slab, a human figure, just a slab in a thin slab, and, very, and, and its uh, features defined by simple drillings. This is a very primitive uh, way of creating a human figure, separating the arms and the legs by drillings, and then the rest, the fingers, sort of very simply in size, the uh, features of the face, very broad mouth, thick eyebrows, also very simply incised, but very powerful in a way. Um, we think it was probably a finial, uh, some ceremonial um, object um, where the bottom part was, would have been inserted into a staff and so forth. Now, it is not as if, and we've seen with the cicada, it's not as if the early jade worker couldn't do fully sculptural object. This is another piece in the Winthrop collection. Um, I would say about three, four hundred years, maximum five hundred years later than this one, but a fully sculptural three-dimensional object um, of another figure and standing pigeon-toed. And the side view shows how he's sort of slightly bent um, in some pose of deference, uh, very elaborate headdress depicted his garment, the sash hanging down the center depicted the, the long um, suspension back of his uh, robe also depicted very clearly. So it's not as if they couldn't do something sculptural. It is very often a matter of choice and perhaps a question of uh, what the object uh, was supposed to be used for. Here, another five hundred, three, five hundred years down the timeline, we have another very sculptural figure here, um, um, depicted kneeling um, in the round. But almost around the same time, you still have these very flat slab-like figures with the holes drilled um, very primitively, just like that, um, for to separate the arms and the body. This is maybe about 1300 BC. This piece is about 500 BC. So we, as art historians, I think we have always to remember that um, artistic development is never linear. There is no one single direction. It, things go back and forth. And we should not be surprised to see uh, multiple uh, um, streamlines. Uh, lines of development happening at the same time. Now, a rare object in the Winthrop collection is this jade beaker or cup with very large bird-shaped handles. 
Um, in general, vessels, containers, cups, and so forth are very rare in jade. Why? Because they demand a lot of consumption of a solid hunk of very precious material. And on top of that, you have to hollow the whole thing out for it to become functional as a cup. Now, again, this is a unique object. There is nothing like it anywhere in any museum that I have come across. And um, in Lur's catalog, he put it very, very late in the early China period. He called it late Eastern Zhou or Han, which means a third or second century BC. But what we now know, and this is the Winthrop piece, is that this cup was actually a much earlier piece, dating to the beginning of the first millennium BC. And here is a, a bronze version of it that is, was excavated and is now in the um, Shanxi History Museum in Xi'an. A, copy, uh, a, a, a pottery version of this, also with these large elaborate bird handles that's in the Seattle Art Museum. And then a wooden, lacquered wooden version of it, um, excavated again from a 9th to 8th century BC tomb, um, in almost fresh out of the ground, as you can tell. So we are pretty confident that the Winthrop beaker or cup belongs in this early first millennium BC group. And again, it's something that Ler could not have known about when he wrote his 1975 catalog. The other thing that is rare and unusual um, and in the container category um, are these two, the pair of jade oval cups and the uh, lidded container with the gilt bronze mounting down here. Now, in my research and in my students' research in Hong Kong, um, we've counted maybe just barely 30 jade vessels that we can, that we know of, either in museums or from excavations. Winthrop, Harvard, has one, two, three, four, the, the beaker we just saw. And then I found this when I was rummaging through storeroom, which was a gift from um, Helen Pratt Dane, uh, subsequent to the original 1942 gift. So this entered the museum in 1950. And it is essentially the same kind of cup, but without the elaborate decoration and um, also counterpart excavated from a second century BC tomb. When the Dane cup was uh, cataloged, when it first came in, it was called Ming Dynasty. And I think it ha was left at that, and no one really bothered to do anything with it. So now I think of the just about 30 vessels in jade that we know of, Harvard has five. So I think we should be very proud of that. The wonderful thing that Harvard also has that are extremely rare are small ornaments like this one and this one that, that is composed of two separate pieces, a dragon here, a bird here, um, connected by a freely moving link. Now, the whole thing was ground out of a single solid piece of jade. It, there is no mechanical join whatsoever. So just imagine the work of first carving these elaborate open work designs and then somehow separating this plaque from that plaque and then um, leaving this link that connects them so that they can move like that um, freely. So Harvard has two. There are a total of um, six that we know of today. Uh, one is in the British Museum, and then the rest 
is in China, two in China from an excavated, uh, three in China from excavations, two in Winthrop, and one at the British Museum. So this is a technical rarity that we do not see very often, and here we have two um, of such examples. Now, another interesting technical thing that, uh, that emerged during my work uh, on the collection are uh, um, with these dragon pendants. In fact, this is one of the highlights of the Winthrop collection. We probably have one of the largest collection of the best and largest and most beautiful dragon-shaped pendants um, anywhere outside of China, okay? And if you look at them, they are all different. I'm only showing you one. They're all different, they're very lively, and um, they're incredibly worked. Um, these pendants were made to be worn um, roughly in this manner, uh, with a series of other jades suspended um, from the belt of a long rope. So it is very important, of course, that it suspends well and is well balanced. Same, this is a more elaborate construction, but essentially you still see these individual uh, pendants, uh, very different in shape and size, being essentially suspended down a central axis. Now, in the Winthrop collection, there are three such dragon pendants that show two suspension holes here. This is a detail. Now, normally you would think, fine, you know, what's, what's in a hole? I mean, it doesn't exist. And actually, Lur noted the, the double holes on these pendants when, when he wrote his catalog, but he didn't go further with it. And what I did was that I, I asked myself, why drill two holes? And you can see from here that the holes were drilled after all the decoration was put in. In other words, it is the last thing the jade worker would do before he hands the product to the client or the purchaser. And he would have spent months or maybe years creating this very elaborate shape, creating these very beautiful uh, relieved designs, incised designs, polishing it to this beautiful high gloss, and then he would drill the hole. Now, if he placed the hole in the wrong place, the, the pendant will not hang properly. And I think that's what happened here. One hole was drilled, and it didn't hang straight. So he had to go and drill a second hole. And that second hole worked. And uh, for students who came to my workshop yesterday, we played with one of these drag dragon pendants, and they could see actually how two different holes worked in terms of the suspension. Now, in, in modern terms, I think Calder would make a good comparison. And in, in one of his writings, um, in, this, in his construction of his mobile, he said, I start by cutting out a lot of shapes. Then I arrange them, calculating for balance, until I think I've found the point of support. This is crucial, as there is only one such point, and it must be right if the object is to hang and pivot freely. Now, this is called a writing in the 20th century with the benefit of a lot of engineering, mechanical engineering principles of balance and all of that. In these dragon pendants, they were created in the fourth century BC by jade workers who were making these gorgeous things and then drilling in the hole at the last minute. Now, the wonder of this is there are very few mistakes. I have gone round to many, many museums and tried, looked at every single one of these dragon pendants. See, most of them have only one hole, and the hole is always drilled correctly. When you, 
when I put a string through it, lift it up, it's balanced. So we are lucky in the Winthrop collection to actually have the mistakes made by a jade worker, and three of them. Because without these mistakes, we probably wouldn't appreciate the significance of their achievement. Um, we can only guess what kind of experience or, or knowledge they might have that would um, allow them to correctly place the whole every time. So, so much for technical things. The links, the placement of the holes. Now, the Winthrop Collection also has very important uh, inscribed jades. The top one is Winthrop. I, I deliberately sort of showed, illustrated them to show your relative proportions. The bottom one is in the Freer Collection, and the detail shows you an inscription incised here, and on the Freer, it's also incised there. Now, um, jades with ins inscriptions in general are rare, and um, ones with long enough inscriptions that uh, talk about events, important events um, in history, are even rarer. Most of the inscriptions on jades deal with auspicious uh, sayings and, and stuff like that, or, or maybe indicate ownership, and that's about it. But both the Freer blade and the Winthrop uh, blade talk about uh, ministers. Um, for instance, in the Freer blade, it was uh, to com commemorate uh, an appointment by the Joe King for a minister to go south as, to act as his emissary. Uh, the Winthrop blade uh, talks about a minister participating in a very important annual ritual um, uh, um, administered by the king himself. So these clearly were important things in their lives, and they commemorate them by inscribing it on a jade blade. Now, to date, blades, jades with this type of very substantive inscriptions uh, number less than the fingers of a hand. We have one of them. Then we have the inscribed blades, the in inscribed jades um, that indicate ownership. And this is a piece in the Winthrop Collection uh, with a poem by the Qianlong Emperor dated 1766 and inscribed along the outer edge, completely along the outer edge of the jizz. So this is endorsement and ownership at the highest possible level. Then I found this one, again rummaging through the storage, a disc from the Dane gift of 1942. This one also has a poem written by the Qianlong Emperor, dated 1747, uh, uh, and it actually preserves the original uh, hardwood frame that it would have been in, uh, set on in the palace. So in some sense, the Dane uh, 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 ownership, the Dane disc, is even more complete than the Winthrop one. Now, another indicator of ownership is this piece, in the, uh, also in the Dane collection, that I discovered. It's an archaistic piece made in jade after a bronze prototype with an inscription on the underbelly of this beast that says, um, made in imitation of antiquity by the great Qing Qianlong Emperor. So again, an 18th century imperial piece, um, lifting jade to the highest possible level in terms of collecting, in terms of ritual and ceremony. Then I found there was actually a whole new category of inscriptions on jades. Again, both are in Winthrop, this you saw, and um, this is a dragon, and on, again, Somewhere, now I don't even remember where now, it's some obscure place on the thickness of the dragon pendant is an inscription that says, uh, middle 43. 
just like that. Then on this disk, a large disk, inscription says the fifth one of 14. Now, this disk actually um, uh, was all of these inscriptions of numbers were read and identified in Lur's 1975 catalog. He couldn't read all of them, um, but um, in this one in particular, I think he read it the other way around. I think the problem with the Chinese numbers um, on a circular trajectory is that if you read it this way, it goes like that. If you turn it around, it, it reads just as well in the other way. So he misread this number, and I unfortunately did not check. It was my problem, my fault. Did not cross-check and repeated this error um, in the catalog. So this is how it should be read. And why is it so important that it's corrected? It's because when a disk is, calls itself, I'm the fifth one of 14, it is reflecting a, a burial practice in, during the third and second century BC, where, and here you see a, a, a drawing of that, where the body was covered with anything from 13, 14, 18, or 23 discs, just like this, with the same kind of decoration. So we now can almost say pretty certain that this disc came from a context like that, was one of 14 that was used in burial of an individual. Now, more than that, I think we, I found that there are other numbers on, uh, inscribed in out of way places on jades. This is a piece in the Sackler collection, and this number is right on the edge here, and it says 523, uh, 24. And then this is an excavated example, very similar to this. And the number says 1,214. What do these numbers mean? We really don't know. What we do know is that, particularly in the case of the excavated examples with these really, really high numbers, they are older jades. By older, I mean 4th, 3rd century BC jades buried in 2nd or 1st century BC tombs. So it's early jade in a late tomb. And you have large numbers, 500s, thousands. So my very preliminary guess is that the, these numbers might reflect either a grading issue, when you say middle, or shang, or top, it might reflect the grade either of the material or of the workmanship. Um, and sometimes, if the number is low enough, it might actually reflect where it's located in a very elaborate pendant. But when you get into the hundreds and thousands, it says something else entirely, at least to me. Um, it says that maybe we are looking at the activities of early collecting, early inventory systems, or even collections management systems. I mean, they are written in places, in exactly the same places that we would write accession numbers these days. Because no one sees them except for the person who knows where to look for them. So this is, to me, you know, an incredibly exciting thing to, to, to learn about the fact that they were collecting, they were amassing these large numbers of jades from earlier generations, and most of these were princely tombs where they were found, and that they were trying in some way to record them, to inventory them, and to sort of do some management, uh, collections management the way we do in museums these days. And the, the wonderful thing is that none of these observations, I mean, these numbers would not be possible to a casual viewer. It has to be handled and studied close up. Now, some bad news. 
I would say. I mean, so far it's all been good news. This, the, the bad news is that we have a, an iconic piece like this one that was in the Winthrop collection, very well published and so on and so forth, lauded as one of the greatest masterpieces of early Chinese art. Um, a, a mirror, a bronze mirror that is inlaid with jade and glass and gold and silver, you know, all of that. And um, it has been unique all this time. There isn't a single comparable piece like it, even with the latest excavations. And so we took it up to the lab. We, Harvard has such a great lab. And, um, and Angela uh, Chang and Catherine Ehrman helped um, put it underneath the um, x-ray. And we discovered that underneath is actually a genuine bronze mirror from the time, from perhaps the second century BC. But there are all sorts of problems with the jade and the glass and how they were attached to the, to the top, the backside of the mirror. So we are now working uh, on trying to be 100% sure that we are dealing not with an original artifact, but something that was put together perhaps at a later time more likely in the 20th century. But not without perhaps some inspiration from genuine artifacts of the time, which this is a, a bronze, a heavily fragmented bronze mirror inlaid with eyeglass beads that was excavated. And so we know that there must have been precedent for this kind of thinking and decoration. Now another, uh, two pieces that's really complicated um, are these large horse heads. Again, quite unique and very special in the Winthrop collection. Um, Ler had dated it Hans, Han or second century BC. And um, they're obviously bronze and ceramic versions of horses from the period, but no jade ones. So, how do we understand this? And then we discovered with x-rays again that there is this huge gouging or uh, perforation underneath stuffed with paper and screws and you know, all sorts, all manner of things that you do not consider uh, ancient. And the holes, according to our scientists, are also extremely neatly and well drilled, very clean. So there is immediately the suspicion that the hole, the drilling, and all the stuffing um, must have been much, much later. Now, it doesn't mean that the horse head is not ancient. There are ancient uh, potentials for something like this. I show you a dragon head um, ornament uh, with a very large um, opening on the other side that was recovered from a pleasure palace of the Tang Dynasty, so 8th, 9th century. And, they, and the archaeologists think that it might have served as the end piece to a banister, a railing, or maybe even furniture. The Sackler in Washington, D.C. also has a similar type of large dragon-headed fitting that dates even later into the 12th or 13th century. So the Winthrop's horses um, may actually be ancient, but perhaps later than we think it is. Now, we're still working on that, so that's another one of things. And of course, uh, those of you who are interested in Chinese jades know this very, very um, famous piece in the Victoria and Albert Museum. It's a cover image for its uh, uh, catalog on Chinese jades. But I went out there, looked underneath, and found this incredibly clean tubular drilling and looked at the piece itself. And I talked to the curator and said, mm, maybe it is not Han Dynasty. Or well, you should sort of look very carefully and sort of do a new study in the same way that we are studying our horse heads. So that there is a case where the verdict is yet to come. A second piece where the verdict is yet to come is this bracelet that's on display. Uh, I think Ler put it in his catalog as date uncertain. 
I now think that it is, he's probably right. On the other hand, I've sort of stuck my neck out and put it, suggested it might actually be Neolithic, around 3,000, 3, between 3,000 and, and 2,500 BC. But there are things about it that is bothersome, um, particularly the alteration that's all the way around throughout, and you can see how feathery and, and crackled it all is, um, except for this one section on the inside where you can see the near pristine material, this pale um, uh, uh, grayish green jade. Now, what caused me to worry about the, the antiquity of this is not just the way the alteration looks, it doesn't look, it looks too even. It's also because of the design where you have uh, multiple, I think eight of these panels with faces on it. We know these faces from excavated sources in the Southeast, in the Neolithic Southeast from 3,000 to 2,500 BC, but nothing excavated in a bracelet is this large or has that many faces? Nothing. On the other hand, the Freer has a piece just like that, also altered in this very sort of amber um, reddish color, um, very sort of uh, fractured um, thing that bothered me when I was in the Freer. And, um, and then there's a third piece in the Royal Ontario Museum in, to <clears throat> in Toronto that is completely unaltered that shows that pure, pristine, light green material, also with many, many faces on it. So that's probably too much information. But the last piece of information I'm going to throw in is that the, this is one of the few pieces that Winthrop had a record of where he got it from. Winthrop didn't keep great records, but he bought it from a Japanese dealer in 1918. Okay, um, Freer also bought stuff in the 19-teens. And this Japanese dealer was actually a very closely associated with the imperial family and the, uh, right after the fall of the Qing Dynasty, it helped them sell a lot of things from the imperial collection so that they can live comf comf uh, comfortably um, outside the, the palace. So the provenance and what we call provenance now, sort of raises a big question as to whether this piece actually might have come from the imperial collection. And if it came from the imperial collection, it might have come, been an archaizing piece, like that big container we saw with the Qianlong um, made after antiquity. So, I mean, all of these things pop up and, and we have no answers to. We looked at it, I did all the research, and we are still at a loss. So this is very much a situation we have to deal with uh, constantly, in spite of all the information that we have. And now finally, we look, why, why, why did that bracelet create so much trouble? It's because of the alteration, because of that surface, it's not it's not real in, in that sense. But then alteration can be 100% real, like this pair of cups we have in the Winthrop collection, where the outside of one is very much altered almost to an opaque ivory color, whereas the outside of the other is almost pristine in, uh, in its original pale green color. Now, um, we think what might have happened was that these two cups were put one on top of the other in a burial, so that the cup that was, didn't change, didn't alter, was inside the other cup, whereby the outside um, being in contact with the burial um, juices and, and waters and all of that um, 
changed into this opaque ivory color. And of course, we have beautiful, totally pristine, unaltered pieces um, that are definitely genuine, ancient. So the whole question of alteration of a Chinese jade has been a major, major issue in connoisseurship, in understanding, and a real challenge in scientific analysis. So finally, we have this wonderful pair, uh, another disc in the Winthrop collection, a jade a disc axe, also in the Winthrop collection, where you have all of this. You have the pristine material, you have the natural discoloration of the stone, and maybe right on the edge some uh, alteration due to burial, and this incredibly beautiful ivory-colored piece that's large, it's on display, it's this big, that we completely do not understand what's going on in terms of the material. Is it pristine, the way it is, like ivory? Is, has it completely changed, ivory-colored? Um, what happened to it? How did this alteration take place? And it is this, these questions about alteration of jade, natural, in burial, or even manually manipulated, that con continues to bug us um, uh, in, because it poses connoisseurship issues, questions, and stuff that, that we are still struggling with. So in spite of all the things that we've learned about Chinese jade, there's still many questions that needed to be answered. But I do hope that you realize, just from these few examples tonight, that you have at Harvard one of the best and most beautiful collections of Chinese jade, and a perfect vehicle for research, for teaching, and for training the next generation of art historians. And that is why I think Winthrop was right on the mark when he said in his presentation to, to Harvard that um, he wanted to give this collection to Harvard and not to a national museum like the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., so that it may, and I quote, it may prove for generations to become a benefit to students of art and lovers of beauty. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was a most interesting and intriguing um, talk. We are sort of at the end of the program, but if there's one burning question, otherwise, you know, you're obviously all welcome to come up and, and speak to Jenny. If there is one burning question, we'll take it. Um, otherwise, I did want to remind you that the gallery is, the first floor gallery is open for you to see some of these amazing works in person. And the shop is open and we're offering 20% off Jenny's book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us and let's give another round of warm applause to Jenny. Thank you.